I want to start from, from the start, from the beginning, I want to say one thing. I am not Gideon Graf. I don't know anything about Zonder Commando the way he does. I'm not the, the Gideon Graf that brought in the whole subject of, uh, of uh, Zonder Commandos. I'm also have nothing, not given anything to the Holocaust as the uh, brother in arms of my father during the revolt, Shlomo Venezia. I got into this thing very, very by chance when I, we realized in Greece that the Greek government is trying to rewrite the history of the disaster of the Jews. And as a journalist, I went on against it with another few historians. And that's how I just got involved in this thing of uh, Holocaust. My expertise is the Middle East. So what I'm going to do here is just going to tell you how my father saw the actual Zonder Commando revolt. Before that, I would like also to say that uh, during the three days that I'm here, during the coffee breaks, a lot of people asked me about afterwards how my father uh, reacted. And it looked, seemed to me that they were more interested in that than about uh, what really happened there. So we'll have, if anybody wants to answer or ask a question about that, we'll do it later. Let me just show you one more thing here before we go on. And he said the laser is this one, right. This is, this, this is the whole uh, um, Birkenau camp, okay? This is crematorium number two, number three, where my father was, number four, where the revolt was, and number five. This here point is where the guard tower and the uh, uh, that are uh, you know supervising the whole operations here. Also, mind you, this here is Canada. That is where the clothes were stored when they arrived. The prisoners arrived. This is the Canada. Okay, and so you can see that between here and here it's easy to get, but from here to here, where my father is and where the revolt happens, it's quite difficult to uh, even see what's going on. Okay, uh, so, um, and also please mind that these four crematoria are isolated from the rest of the camp. They are barbed wire, they are a camp within a camp. So, in, 19, uh, in April 1944, the last uh, transport from Greece leaves for Auschwitz, and it's uh, uh, about 2,300 the moment they arrive in Auschwitz, about 650 are left alive and they are sent to various jobs uh, all the rest of the 2300 are executed in the gas chambers okay ah, okay uh, <laughs> they are, they are, they are uh, uh, sent to the gas chambers uh, uh, around august just a bit before august the zonder commander decides to uh, make an uprise, not only as Sonderkommandos, but the entire camp of Auschwitz. They decided that they're going to revolt against the, uh, their, their, their guards and the Germans. The Russians are already, you can hear the cannons of the Russians uh, from, farther, uh, from far away, so they think that this is the right moment to do it. They decide to do it on August the 15th. August the 15th is the uh, uh, Christian celebration of the uh, passing away of Mary, the Virgin Mary. So they decide it's going to be more relaxed and that way it will be easier to overpower the guards and the whole camp will uh, go on, on, a, on, a, on a, a, a rising and overcome their guards. Uh, for reasons of the uh, Polish underground decides that we will not do it because the Russians are already coming very close, they say to the uh, 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 people that are in the, uh, in, Auschwitz, in the Auschwitz camp. So there is no reason for more bloodshed. Any moment now, the Russians are going to walk into Auschwitz and there is no need to go, to, uh, on to, to go on to the uprising. Of course, the Russians bypass at that moment Auschwitz and they are left alone again. The prisoners are left alone. At a certain moment, there is a guy, a very respected uh, guy, a Polish guy called Kaminsky. This Kaminsky is extremely respected not only by the prisoners, but also by the SS themselves. Uh, he had what uh, Gideon Graf says, that it is a leadership quality. And everybody really adored him and respected him. He was one of the guys that also initiated and organized the first the revolt that would, would, should take place on the 15th of August. For 
He's been betrayed after the uh, uh, after the, 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 the revolt was postponed, was not postponed, was canceled. He is uh, executed. He is uh, betrayed by uh, a capo, not a Jewish capo. Usually the capos were not Jews, were especially in the crematorium. They were criminals from Poland and other countries with criminal records. And uh, Kaminsky did not say a thing and was executed. Around that time, there was some, there's another uh, event that starts to galvanize a bit the uh, Zonderkommando, and that is the execution, the attempt to escape and execution of what in the last three days we've been calling Alex or Albert Herrera, a Greek officer, uh, the guy that also took some pictures that we saw, the professor here showed us a few pictures. Uh, so he is also uh, sent with another guy to the river in order to throw the ashes into the river, the Vistuna. There he decides, he takes a shovel, he hits one SS, apparently kills him, also uh, uh, wounds the next SS, jumps into the river, starts swimming, People arrive there, immediately one of, the, one of the SS starts shooting. People arrive there, to make a long story short, they kill him. <clears throat> Although he was, uh, when he would put up his head in order to, to, to breathe, he was shot, killed, brought back, put on display for every Zonderkommando to see that he is there. Uh, there are various myths about this guy uh, from various people, uh, just to give an example of what I'm saying about rewriting the history in Greece, the Greeks say that uh, this guy was thrown alive into the furnace, into the ovens, which is not, of course, it is a lie because we have it from my father, we have it from Shlomo Venetia, we have it from Nazari, we have it from everyone that was in those camps in the, in the uprising that they went through and saw him with wounds in his head. Around uh, that time, the 300,000 Hungarians come and uh, the Germans take 250 Greeks from Corfu as Zonderkommando. They explain to them what they're going to do. They refuse to do it and they are shot on the spot. Once the Zonderkommando of the group of my father and the rest of the guys with, that are with him, as we said, uh, Venezia, Nazari, and all those, arrived at the camp, they isolate them in uh, uh, barracks 13, from there they take them and they take them to the Zonderkommando. So uh, here's one thing I would like to say uh, that the, uh, the, when you ask me, a lot of people ask me here, how did he, uh, did he ever talk about it? Did my father ever talk about it? And I always said, yes, he did, but uh, he only talked to me, not to my mother and to my sister he talked. But he always talked in a very funny way. He didn't make us frightened. I mean, when I left home to go to Israel to, uh, on a kibbutz, I was 12 years old, my sister was 11, and we already knew about the Zonderkommando, we knew about everything, my mother did not. So what he was telling, one of the stories he always used to say is that he, uh, how, he, how he got sucked by the, by the Germans. The Germans come to Block 13 and tell him, you know, Leon, uh, he knew excellent Germany, uh, German and French. He spoke five languages, and uh, German and French were almost his mother tongue. So he knew excellent German. He said, we need about 50 people to come to work for us, the SS tells him. And he says, you know what? We are 156 Greeks. We came together. Come on, be a, a sports and let me take them with him all together. So the, 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 the Nazi says, sure, okay, why not? You'll be fed there, you'll be this, and also, just for you to know, take also new uniforms and put them on. And my father says, we're so proud, and I was so proud that I probably would, was able to take my friends also with me, so we're gonna have better conditions. And we start marching throughout the camp, all over the camp here like that, singing Greek military patriotic songs that are very proud of it until we get into here, the gate closes, and then there's one Jew there that says, Welcome to the Zonderkommando. And he says, what is Zonderkommando? And he explains to him what Zonderkommando is. And he says, Jean, to, I know that he regretted it till the day he died, that he always thought that he, in order to make good to his friends, he probably put them in a worse con uh, uh, condition. But the way he said about how he felt later, how stupid he felt by, you know, marching around the camp and singing Greek patriotic songs. He thought that this is it, we're okay now. Uh, so when 
at a certain point, uh, somewhere around the 7th of October, the, um, a few days before, they hear that there's going to be a reduction in the number of the Sonderkommando. Why? Because there is no more transports coming in from Europe. The Jews are almost exterminated, so they don't need so many Sonderkommando. And so they decide that there's going to be a revolt. There's going to be a reduction. The Germans decide there's going to be a reduction in numbers. And so on the 7th, the Greeks know about it. Not only the Greeks and the Poles and everybody. I want to make this very clear that this is one of the other reasons that I have against the Greek government. They're trying to present the revolt of the Sonderkommando as a Greek thing. And they're trying to bring it back to the glory of... Leonidas and the 300 Spartans and Thermopylae and all that things. You know, the Greeks have this kind of uh, thing today. That's the only thing they have going for them, so that's how they present it. And, and that's one of the things that uh, we're trying to explain, that it's not a Greek. It was also Greek, but not a Greek. It's a Jewish revolt, yes, but it's not a Greek revolt. So uh, in the um, here, number three and number four, most of the Greeks are there meaning that each one of these uh, crematorium have 169 people. Think that the Greeks are about 56 here and about 60 in the other uh, number four. That's more or less the, real, the actual numbers. Okay, so uh, the gerbils decide that they're going to start by uh, reducing the numbers and they come here to number four. They call them out and they start Count, saying names, saying that those who will hear their names should go over to number five. The first names are called out. They're Greek names, nobody moves. So all of a sudden, a guy by the name of Joseph Varuch from Salonika says, okay guys, are we going to jump them or not? It's a Greek slang. I'm just right now saying it in English, but it's a Greek slang that says, are we going to really burst through? That's the, the actual thing. And at that moment, they start, they jump onto the guards, they take away whatever weapons they could, some Greeks and Poles, some few, very few, try to disarm the revolt, the, 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 the rebellers, the people that rebel, they try the, the, to take their arms away to give it to the Germans. They did not, not succeed. There's a start of shooting and kicking and beating. The guard here realizes what happens, sounds the alarm and allows those people here, the, the, the SS to come to help from here where the, the main offices of the of soldiers to come here and help uh, uh, crush the, uh, rebe the, uh, the rebellion, the revolt. At that point, the Greeks, 25 Greeks, realized that this is it. This is the end of the game. The whole thing lasted, the whole revolt that we call, lasted about 10 minutes, 15. Don't think it's people that are fighting for day and night like it was in Varsha, Ghetto, Varsha. So the 25 Greeks realized they're dead. This is the end of the game. And they retreat within the crematorium number four, along with a few more Poles and the famous Philip Miller. Seeing that they have no chance, here is a myth or not, we do not know. Some women, Greek women that worked at Canada here said that they heard the Greeks singing the Greek anthem before they put fire to the place and blew themselves up. We do not know that for sure. It could be hearsay, it could be a myth. One thing is for sure. They decided to commit suicide in, in order in not to give in, to be slaughtered, as my father used to say, like lambs. My father, number three, also had some kind of a, he was the oldest of the group that came in. He was about 32 years old when Shlomo Venetia is 17 and his brother is 18. So he was kind of a father figure already, had experience from the war uh, against the Nazis and against Italian, the Italians in 1940 when the World War II broke out. So he was more or less, uh, they, 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 they came to him as a natural leader because he was the oldest. And also he knew German, don't forget, it was very important too. So he was the organizer in the uh, crematorium number three, where he's supposed to wait for the uh, sign, the signal, in order to start the revolt. And uh, 
Shlomo Venetia in his book says he has an axe at his wedding. He was told by my father, you wait here. The moment the guard comes, you just on his head and that's it. We'll take, the, we'll take it from there for the rest of the things. What happens is that they did not expect this call to, of reduction by the Germans to happen at that moment. So everybody gets confused. They don't know exactly what it is. They see smoke from here. These guys think, is it the, 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 the rebellion? Did the, did the revolt start? No, yes, no, yes. So they try to see what happens. They get down there before they can come out of the door. At number three, the couple locks them in. That's how the entire number three uh, crematorium was saved. He locks them in. These guys here at number two decide to cut the wires and flood. They flee, they are caught, they are all executed within the, the, the uh, either burned into a, uh, a, 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 some kind of a stable that was, they, they found as, as, as a resort to, to hide themselves or they were executed. The same thing goes for number five as well. They try to get out of there to go to the woods, but they are also found out and executed. So what happens is that actually only number three remains intact. Uh, why didn't they uh, execute number three? For a very simple reason. They needed them to, 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 to uh, burn the rest of the people of the revolt. And that's why number three survived. That is in a nutshell what really, as far as I can say, and as I said before, I'm not an expert, but apparently from most of the historiography we have, uh, apparently this is what happened more or less. Um, how many killed? Here, I'll give you one um, example of how uh, you, you can, uh, this is mine? These are mine, thank you, okay. Yeah, you're too young to wear glasses. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> <laughs> say yes, say yes, I am young. What do you have to say you wear glasses? Uh, Who knows that? <laughs> so, um, how many do you think, what, the, 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 the myth was, of course, that, you know, 300 were killed, we, the SS, the this, the, all in all, three non-commissioned officers were killed. Uh, there were 14 wounded, and crematorium four was uh, destroyed. The next day, 450 victims of the revolt were burned in the crematorium, and from the 198 Greeks that were, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 that remained, only 26 Greeks had survived. And uh, my father always used to say that it was a great mistake, and he also says this in his book, that it was a great mistake that the revolt did not take place on the 15th. He said the Russians would have helped, the, probably the, um, it would be a, 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 there would be a, a revolt by 125,000 people, all inmates. And um, the Germans will not be able so far to, 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 to to go against so much people. And that's what he always said until um, the day he died. So there is a, to come back to the actual thing, it, it is that a lot of, um, a lot of stories and myths exist about this revolt. So uh, it, it's something that you have to be taken with a very, very, uh, with a lot of salt, not only a grain of salt, but a lot of salt. Uh, finally, one more thing as uh, a general thing, because a lot of you people think that, say, ask the question, why didn't they speak? Why didn't they this when they came back, with this, especially the Zonder Commando? I'll tell you why by doing a comparison to something else. The first Greek Jew to come back from Poland was a guy by the name of Leon Batis. He was the first one. He was not a Zonder Commando. He was the first one. He just survived Auschwitz. He came back. He went to the synagogue the first Saturday. Here comes the new guy from Poland, Leon. They're Sephardic, so they speak Spanish. ¿Qué está pasando? ¿Qué pasó ahí? What happened there? What is it happening? So he starts telling them what he saw. And this is what I'm telling you now is the quotes of his son, of him personally before he died, of my mother that was in the synagogue and all of the witnesses that are, there to, that are still alive today. And the people started shaking their heads and saying one to another, poor guy, he's gone crazy. So the rabbi said, okay, don't worry, we'll find an asylum to put him in. 
until it gets wetter because he's talking about gases, he's talking about ovens, he's talking about burning corpses. The guy is mad. They could not believe it until other people started arriving and they said the same things that only then did the Greek Jewish community that lost about 92, 93% of its population there decided that it was true. So if he could not talk about it and they could not believe it, how much, as we say in Hebrew, even furthermore, you could not have the Zonderkommando say what they said. My father finally survived by the death of March and he was liberated by the Americans at Edinburgh. Thanks a lot. <laughs>